digitally accessible. Digital accessibility simplified. Um, and so uh, just a, a little bit of, you know, in GAD, um, you know, in, in GAD's ways, I, I am, I go by she and her. Um, my hair on one side is very short on the right. And on the left, um, it is a little bit longer, probably closer to about my, my chin length. Um, so that gives you a little bit about me. Um, and so without further ado, I like to just jump right on in. Um, so for me, procurement accessibility, um, for better, or for worse, this is my love. Um, there's just so much information here and education around procurement and accessibility and accessibility, you know, there's very few black and white areas, um, I feel like, and procurement is one of the very few that you can actually draw a line in the sand, which I think is so important. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, I, I want to just kind of go over a, a lot of different things today. And I'm going to take my video back off because I do see a start, a slow lag in my in my internet. Um, but with that, just really kind of talking about the, the integration of accessibility, uh, talking about VPATS and the, the approach in which you can do for procurement overall, and even that of contracts and language and things like that, and how to really understand better about um, that of your infrastructure. So it really is important to be able to understand how accessibility does move across an entire organizational infrastructure. And it doesn't matter if you are a you know, Fortune 500, if you're a small mom and pop, if you're finance, if you are anything else in between, um, accessibility does truly play a part in all areas and procurement especially. So when we're talking about this, um, this is just a small breakdown within some of your roles and the responsibilities specifically around that of your procurement. So when we're thinking about this, like the business requirements and identifying the risk of have you checked if you're using third party tools, if you are integrating and using maybe agencies, have you made sure that you've built in time to be able to test for accessibility? Um, when we're talking about procurement, it's not always when we are purchasing third party, but it's also if you yourself are creating something that your customers may be asking you information for your products and things. So there's a couple of different things to think about in this different instance. And this is just an overall breakdown of what it could look like and just your roles and responsibilities of accessibility from a very top down approach. And when we think about that, we really start to think how we can shift left as much as possible over to procurement within that project initiation stage. So if we're thinking about this from an internal project that you may be developing, um, maybe a software application, or maybe you're creating a website. When we are thinking about that project initiation for accessibility, we are thinking about, are we providing time and training to ensure our individuals are knowledgeable of that of accessibility? Do they have a definition of done in place? Um, does each of the different stages understand what it is that they are responsible for for accessibility? Now, if you're creating a software or an application, a VPAT, a voluntary product accessibility template, is going to be something that you often get asked for by your customers. And by doing your testing and moving accessibility very early in that stage is going to benefit you when you are trying to sell the software. Whereas if you are maybe creating a website, then, you know, procurement itself may not necessarily apply there unless you're hiring different services to help you create that website or maybe um, an agency to design it or maybe content right and things like that. It's still going to be important if you are utilizing anything outside of your own direct group that you're making sure that those other individuals are gonna be ex responsible for accessibility as well. And that still falls within the procurement phase because you're contracting these services out. So no matter what procurement really is truly one of those first things that we don't often think of when we talk about shift left for accessibility, but that's really kind of the focus in today's point. So the, the four steps really of building accessibility is, um, understanding it and how different users with disabilities will use the web, which if you're familiar with WCAG, um, it's broken down into four principles and it's called the POUR, P-O-U-R, so perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So that understanding how different users are going to use the web is part of that perceivable instance. Um, the other one is gonna be that training that I had mentioned to make sure that everyone in the stages are 
understanding and aware of what they need to know for that that specific role, but then the understanding and knowing the standards. And most of the time we look at WCAG 2.1 level AA as a standard across the board. There have been rumors of WCAG 2.2 coming out by the end of this year, but that has also been said for about a year now. So I'm not going to hold my breath. I'm going to wait to see what happens. So we do look at WCAG 2.1 level AA as an industry standard to make sure that you are complying to uh, the requirements. Now, I mentioned WCAG now. It's going to be important to understand that it's international, and I'll kind of dive into that a little bit more um, here soon. But then the other one is really using tools. What kind of tools can you use? And, you know, talking about tools, the session prior, talking about digitally accessible, that the tools they have, you know, there's a lot of free tools. And one that most commonly used as outsiders is WebAIM Wave. It's free. It runs a single page. Um, if you look at anybody, you know, that's just starting to understand accessibility a little bit, that's usually the one that they, they use and work with. But what are you using and how do you have that integrated within your life cycle? And are you testing it on the vendors that you are trying to procure as well as your own stage environment. So these are some of the things to think about as we dive into that of truly the accessible procurement process. So a couple things is when you're setting up your priorities and then you're preparing to buy. So this is going to be if you're using a third party agency to develop, um, if you're going to be purchasing a software, Think about it as we all use Microsoft and Adobe products. So even something as simple as that, we all use it. So put your mindset into setting up your procurement priorities and what you're looking for when you use your everyday software. So we're asking, are they committing their accessibility mindset, right? Um, asking them some questions of, do they have an accessibility statement? Um, what are they doing for their products? Do they have a VPAT? Um, and really asking, you know, sometimes you need to actually gain your executive buy-in to be able to promote and push this information if you're working within a procurement atmosphere. Nine times out of 10, you happen to be someone who mentioned something about accessibility and now you wear that accessibility hat, but you're having to work with procurement to see if they can make sure that we're looking at accessible products. But these individuals don't know what they're asking for. So that's where that buy-in from a top-down approach is gonna be very useful to kind of go back to that shift left pers uh, perspective. And doing so is really allowing you to set up those standards and create a plan for procurement. Now, one of the things that I've seen has worked very well is when it comes to procurement, we're talking specifically about accessibility today, but procurement involves security, integration, compatibility, you know, the procurement themselves, are they following the process? So maybe think about it from an enterprise architecture standpoint. Do you have a program in place that allows you to check for everything? So that way, as someone goes to purchase something new, it kind of goes through the checklist. So that way you can incorporate accessibility as part of it, but it's not just accessibility. So maybe it doesn't meet your security requirements. That's a higher risk than accessibility, but then it might take away the need of having to put those efforts into checking for accessibility if it automatically doesn't pass security. So think through about how you can identify an overall procurement strategy to check for all things that are needed and make sure you incorporate accessibility into it. Um, when you're starting to actually buy, so if you are looking at it, you know, we're always researching vendors to see what meets our business case. And sometimes we might issue an RFI before that of an RFP, and it's the request for information versus that of the request for proposal. So in that RFI is where it's going to be important to make sure you let individuals know that you're looking for someone who can develop to WCAG 2.1 level AA if it's an agency that's developing information, or if it's a product, asking them if they meet WCAG 2.1 level AA. So what does that really look like? Um, so as your stages, you have that addressing accessibility in the RFI in the very far left. And then it kind of issues into the middle of that issuing that RFI. Now, it is important to make sure that in your um, question time frame that you allow for people to, to be able to respond and ask questions about that RFI, that you really call out accessibility because nine times out of 10, 
the vendors are starting to look at this and they kind of skip over it, not really knowing what it might be. And then questions come in when it's usually too late and you get very little information. So by the time you have your vendor meeting, you're having to ask the accessibility questions at that point, which then you might learn they may or may not be addressing accessibility, which could have actually cut them out of that vendor meeting overall. So find a process that works well for you within that stage. Um, you know, outlining your accessibility requirements and also asking those specific questions about their experience. If it's gonna be designing and developing, ask them for other customer recommendations or referrals that have also um, had a WCAG requirement because you won't be able to have a VPAD in that instance. Or maybe ask them about their testing implementation. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can do, but most importantly, when we get to those vendor meetings, um, that is really when we're maybe asking them about employees with disabilities that test their products and things like that. That's truly your opportunity to start to ask some of the hard questions and see exactly what they can show you in regards to accessibility of their products. So kind of issuing those solicitations, you've heard me mention RFI and the RFP is truly that proposal. So that proposal is where you can require documentation like a voluntary product accessibility template, a VPAT. If they don't submit one, they don't meet the minimum requirements that you're asking. And what that's doing is you might actually be the first person asking that question to a vendor. And you may be pushing that for them to have to go to an accessibility company like Digitally, Digitally Accessible to, you know, test it to create a VPAT. Um, so your questioning is going to be beneficial, not just for you, but for all the other customers that this vendor might have. Um, so it's really important to be able to define your accessibility requirements. Um, and then within that, also document some of the language around accessibility. So when you are looking about, you've heard me mention a lot about VPATs, right? So when you are asking for a VPAT, this is something that you could potentially tie the VPAT into part of your contractual language because there's usually three different VPATs that I've seen. Um, aside from if you ask a vendor for a VPAT and they don't have one or don't know what one is, that's an automatic red flag because they're not putting accessibility in as a priority. Now, the next one is if they do have a VPAT, who filled it out? Is it a sales guy because he knows he needs to meet that requirement? Is it an internal to where it's someone in the dev, but they may not necessarily know accessibility? Or are they using an external service to be able to create that VPAT and, and fill it out? And what I found is sometimes when it is a, a salesperson or someone that is lacking knowledge of accessibility, they may, they may just go down the line and say, support, support, support. And if you tie the VPAT level of compliance to your contractual information, then if you do find that there's accessibility issues, then that helps you within that proposal, within the, the VPATs themselves, to make sure that that conformance that they originally stated could be brought up to speed. Because otherwise, there are some vendors that say, oh, well, we're not accessible. But to do that is going to be a lot of work. So if you pay us an extra $5,000, we'll do that. But the reality is, is we pay 100% for 100% of our customers. There's about 15 to 20% of individuals globally that have some form of disability. So we're not paying for 85 80% of our customers, we're paying for 100%. So it's important to use and identify the questions um, as you're evaluating the, the different proposals as well as the VPATs. Now, there are some things that when identifying a vendor to meet your business needs, um, there's some questions that you can ask them to really help narrow down um, in regards to what may best meet the accessibility requirements that you come up with. Um, so questions when you're doing research, you know, when you're submitting that, having them submit that RFP, it could be, you know, does the company have a policy or an accessibility statement around accessibility? This might be something you can easily Google from the company. Um, you know, what is the product designed? Um, you know, is it designed to meet the accessibility standards? And if so, that's where that VPAT needs to come to come in. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a VPAT looks like and what it means to have a good VPAT versus a bad one.
Um, maybe ask the question of does the vendor test with users um, with disabilities or maybe do they uh, provide you know, support based within video or audio um, using closed captions within videos or making sure their documentation on how to use the application is also accessible because a lot of times that might be PDFs and things. So are they making it accessible across the board? Um, and then furthermore, you know, looking at it from an SLA is when you do find an issue within that of the product, what is a, their SLA to make the change when it does have something to do with accessibility? Um, that's gonna be important because as we kind of talk about the, the you know, managing that performance overall and the relationships, um, if you have a user who has a disability and there's an accessibility issue that's critical. So most of the time you have um, severe, like a, a critical, high, medium, and low severity. And if something runs into a critical or a high, it's likely going to block that user using assistive technology from completely achieving the work in which they have to do. Well, for you or I that may not have a disability, that's not any different than a system shutdown because we can't do our work. So where is the SLA for accessibility as a one-to-one -one ratio for that of other users as well. So thinking about that is gonna be very important as you collaborate um, your relationship and document your procurement process and make sure that it's implemented um, and really learn from a success so you can identify those areas of growth throughout as you work with some of your different vendors. So you've heard me mention VPATS a lot. So voluntary product accessibility templates. So first and foremost, what is it, right? So in short, it's an accessibility checklist almost that tells you it either supports, does not support, or um, su you know, partially supports in regards to accessibility. Think of it as a self-disclosing um, of the product from that vendor. And we are wanting to make sure that they list the standards in which they are complying to. And you've heard me mention WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That is the international version, but dependent upon your location, um, there are sometimes different standards that you mentioned, and we'll, we'll talk about that very briefly. Um, but it's going to be helpful for you to be able to have a Windows view into the level of accessibility that they may be able to promote. And that's really the importance of asking a VPAD. Now, a VPAD is not 100% accurate any of the time. I mean, I've not seen very accurate VPATs throughout my 20 years of, of accessibility. Um, but with that being said, it does give you an idea on what to look for, red flags and things like that to know how accurate is the information. Are they really making accessibility priority based upon even how that VPAT is completed? And we'll go through and kind of show you a couple of things that you can do as a call out for that. But, you know, when is it needed? That's the biggest question. So if you are looking at an RFP, sometimes if you're the software um, company, then look out, RFPs are asking more and more for VPATs. Um, if you are selling to anything that is state, local, or federal governments, especially even that of education, I'm speaking to that of the states, but there's also other regions that have government requirements that they are asking for VPATs. Um, corporate, you know, they can actually, if you're a corporate company, you're a mom and pop, you are, you know, finance, whatever, wherever you may fall, you can also be asking your third party companies for a VPAT as well. Um, so when it talks about websites and development, this is not necessarily when a VPAT applies, but we do often get a lot of questions of, hey, is your website accessible? I am, you know, my customers are, you know, coming to you to, to buy this produce and is your site accessible? I need a VPAT. Well, a VPAT doesn't directly apply, but we can still provide you um, information around how we do our testing, um, maybe the, the roadmap or remediation timeframes. You can still create something that works for you as your company's best practice. So when it's a website or development of something that you can still provide that out. But more importantly, if you are procuring 
these things with other companies that are creating these websites or development that you're asking them for, hey, can I talk to some other customers that have asked for WCAG compliance? Um, what do you do to achieve WCAG? Do you do internal testing? Do you test with individuals with disabilities? These are a lot of where those questions can come in if you are working with a company that's going to be developing a website or something for you. So the applicable standards, you've heard me mention WCAG. So for the states, um, it's going to be something called Section 508. Uh, for Canada, uh, you all are very familiar. So it's AOTA. And actually, Bill C-81, that's about a year old now, is one of the newest ones. So Bill C-81 is very similar to that of the states of Section 508. It's all of Canada. So they've taken the best of AOTA and, you know, because there are different areas that have had pop-ups of accessibility compliance, now all of Canada has that. Um, if you're in Europe, it's EN301549. So when we're talking about these, it is important that we look at WCAG. Now, AOTA and Section 508 reference WCAG 2.0. Europe, however, references WCAG 2.1. So if you are a company that you want to stand out to make sure that you are saying, hey, I am, I, I'm making accessibility a priority, then you truly want to look at WCAG 2.1, regardless of if you sell to the US or Canada or whatever else, because if at any point in time those areas update, you're already in using WCAG 2.1. And then if you have customers that are from Europe, then you're also automatically meeting their requirements as well. Now, AOTA is not mentioned on here because when we're looking at VPAT specifically, AOTA is actually not one of the callouts for that. Um, so it is looking at either WCAG compliance, Section 508 for the states, or Europe. So when are these guidelines used? Like, how do you know what works where? So first and foremost, ask, you know, asking like what regions, um, you know, if you're, the, if you're the seller, what regions do you sell in? If you sell globally, then you cer certainly want to look at WCAG 2.1 and maybe look at the, the Europe standard from there because that has that, that Europe. If you are selling to groups of the federal government or things that are starting to require some of these, then again, that might be um, one of the ones that you're starting to think about. Whereas if you are not the application or you know developer of this that you're selling out, but rather you are looking to buy, then where are the, the vendors that you're buying from live in? What regions are they? Because then when you're asking about accessibility and you might be buying something from um, say Canada or the US and they say, well, we comply to WCAG 2.0, but your policy for your company is referencing WCAG 2.1, that's a little bit of a discrepancy. So how can you make sure that you're still going to work to meet the needs that you have within your policy? So really understanding um, what guidelines are used when is gonna be very important. So the VPAT itself. So this is just a very small snippet on the screen that I have. It shows the criteria on the far left. And it has that of level A using 4.1.2. And then in the middle, there's conformance level. And in this instance, it's showing that of the revised section 508. Um, and it's talking about partially supports. And then it has on the far right, the remarks and explanations talking about the features as well as the exceptions. So here, you must include the applicable standard that applies. So let's say for this specific instance, maybe it's a company that sells to the federal government and that group is looking for Section 508 compliance. That's why they called out and used that of Section 508. But if you look in the very far left column under criteria, um, this is where you do have EN 301549, you have the revised section 508, or you actually have that of the supporting documents. This is also where you can have a WCAG instance. So identifying which VPAT you're going to use, ITIC.org is the ones that own the template of the VPAT. Um, so there you can actually go through and access the international one that has all of these into it, um, or you can download only the Section 508 or only the WCAG or only the EN301549. I recommend the international because it doesn't matter who you are, who you sell to, where you buy from, then your international is going to cover that of your 
chapters at the bottom, which we'll talk about very briefly, but also is going to reference that of WCAG 2.1 um, because Section 508 has fewer guidelines to meet than that of 2.1. So 2.0 is less than 2.1. So how do you know what a good VPAT looks like? Well, if you go through the line and it just says supports and there's no remarks or explanations, then that's of concern. Even if it says supports, there should, there should still be something in there to be able to state um, all images have alt text, you know, something to where it shows proof that they've put a little bit of effort into it. Because if you just see something that has a straight line of supports, then that's a red flag to look at. Um, a couple other red flags to look at are, you know, is it filled out properly? So what we have here on the screen is a, a sample from an ACE company accessibility conformance report for that of VPAT. It's using the version 2.4 and this one's using the WCAG version. So number one is the name of the product and the version documented. So if the version is there and say, in this case, it's 2.0 and you're now working on 4.0, that's a red flag because they've not updated their VPAT. We know they've made changes to the code. Um, you know, another one is maybe the report date was from 2020 and now here we are in 2022. Well, that's two years worth. I would have to ask the question, have you made changes? You know, maybe you're still on version 2.0, or maybe you're on version 2.5. Maybe you need to ask them the change management of what they've gotten to from that 2.0 to, to that 2.5, because the report is actually two years out of date. How much change has actually been made? Is this still reflecting accurately? The product description is important, um, but the other one is that contact information. Are they giving you an individual or specific group to be able to reach out to if you have questions about the VPAT? If it's just going to be a very generic email of info at you know, company.com, that's usually a concern because um, it's not really giving you a direct point of contact, which then leads me to believe who is actually incorporating and making accessibility a priority if they don't have a point of contact. The notes are also important. The notes is going to give you a little bit of information about the application, maybe about the operating system. It could sometimes just be a summary overall of the accessibility found from that of the VPAT. So your notes is sometimes just your summary and that's gonna give you a very quick and easy way to identify where you are in meeting compliance. The last one is the evaluation methods, number five. Now, if this is not completed, then that's another red flag, but we should be looking at automated and manual testing. And manual testing should be that of your keyboard, your Zoom, that of assistive technology of JAWS, NVDA, um, also maybe even using Dragon Naturally Speaking. Are they using multiple browsers? Um, and then more importantly, did they use or list the browsers as well as the tools that they've used? If you see an evaluation method and it just says automated testing, then that's a red flag. And because automated tools, as I'm sure you've heard today, only make up about 20 to 30 percent of accessibility issues and the rest requires manual testing. So if they say that they've only used automated testing for evaluation, then that's another red flag. Now, I've worked with a lot of different groups throughout my, my career. So I've been on the side of asking vendors for VPATs. I've been on the side of receiving the request for VPATs. And I've also been on the side of the companies that are completing the VPATs. So I've seen it from all three avenues. And I will say one of the things that I've seen requested is in the very bottom right is completed by. If you are using a third party company or if you are doing it internally, just let them know who filled it out, completed by the ABC Accessibility Company. Because what that does is it automatically takes a level of curiosity or concern out from the requester because then they can see, oh, hey, an accessibility company did this, so I don't have as much to worry about. Whereas sales guy or developer, then we have a little bit more to worry about. So truly looking at a good VPAT example, 
this is a starting point of just that first page to know whether or not you're actually getting a VPAT that's going to be usable before you even dive into the rest. So if you're missing anything from here, then that's going to be a quick, easy flag to be able to likely have to send back to the vendor because there's going to be some accessibility concerns. Now, if you've gotten past the first page with all of these areas, then we dive into that of the remarks and explanations and why they are so important. So going back to, this is the same image that I showed very early on of that criteria on the far left, looking at the 4.1.2. Um, and the compliance level in the middle is the revised section 508. Because it's partially supports, the remarks and explanation shows that of the features, as well as that is of the exception. So the exception now tells me that it's an interactive element, read as plain text, and the expanded collapse state for the button is not announced. So everything is working except those two areas. So now I can simply say, hey, what's your roadmap for those two instances to be made accessible? And now I know that if I have individuals with disabilities having to use the software applications, those are going to be the items that are going to be problematic. Whereas if this is left blank, you're kind of just wondering, well, partially supports, does that mean two items supported and the rest failed? Or is it vice versa? You don't know. So that's why it's so important for that remarks and explanation. So this is the second part of that. You've gotten past that first page and you've gotten to this point, then this also starts to give you an idea of how well that VPAD is fully completed. So you heard me mention a little bit about chapters. So chapters are going to be located in the section 508 and the EN 301549 or the international versions of the VPATs from ITIC. Now, chapters are important because a lot of times, especially if you are providing only for hardware, this is one of the only ways that you can provide a VPAT. So the chapters are going to essentially kind of be a summary wise of all of that of the success criteria. So when we kind of go through and look at that, it identifies all of these different things of um, supports, does not support, partially supports, but then here's the overall summary of it, of its supports and here it is with your remarks and explanations. But this is especially important when you are using hardware. Um, there is also a document section. So if you have documentation on how to use your products, there's also a chapter here. So the chapters are very important because users who don't necessarily have a clue procurement officials of what they're looking for on a VPAT, they just know that they're told to have to ask for it this is going to be a nice summary for them to be able to have an, you know, have an idea to be able to promote it to the group that's asking for it as to which vendors may meet the minimal requirements to be able to move on. So it's really important to also look at the, the chapter sections. So we've talked a lot about VPATs. We've talked a little bit about procurement, but really it starts in that contractual language. And this is that line in the sand. This is that one area that can be black and white from the day in which you have contractual language included accessibility. You can now state that any products, you know, purchased from June 1st on is now meant to comply to accessibility. Now, does that mean every product you're going to purchase does? No, but you at least have contractual language and you now have something to work with to where if a vendor isn't accessible and you do get a complaint or an issue, you have something to work with with them. You know, so with that, you know, just to identify a lot of the different things, um, we need to make sure that as part of that sample process, we ask the vendors to provide um, information around accessibility. We validate them. A lot of times it is by that VPAT. Sometimes you can use the automated tools to check if the page itself from that company is accessible because a website is far easier to make accessible than an application. So just be sure to review the procurement process as, as it's really implemented and learn from your, success, your successes, but also identify areas that you might need growth in. This is going to be a journey. It's not going to be an overnight solution. Um, when you're going through and requesting those RFPs, these are just some of the questions that I had mentioned um, earlier on. So that way you can start to identify what you can use. So, you know, this is again, one that 
it will be growth. You'll learn from mistakes. You might identify more precise questions that you can start to ask. And that's good. That's the point of when you're starting to really truly implement accessibility into that of the procurement process and contractual language is one of those. So when you're looking for requesting information, um, I, I had mentioned before, do you use users with disabilities to test? Um, asking, you know, do they have a policy or statement? Um, what are they doing to ensure WCAG compliance as they make updates? You know, if we look at our, you know, our life cycle process, whether it's product or otherwise, um, we have a change management system usually. So what is the company's change management as they are making updates, the tracking of the updates and of their product or their service to have that launch? So it could be a roadmap or it could be a track change because commonly you'll see within VPATS, um, a lot of companies aren't going to update them every single time they update a version. So if you have a VPAT, how can you still learn what's been what's been made changes to and that's where that change management could be useful um, if it's not accessible then what so that's where we really start to ask the question of does it meet the business need and does business need trump accessibility um, is it a requirement for individuals for their jobs what can you do to provide an equally effective alternative if someone does need to use the product and the product is not accessible. Maybe it's the only product out there that can do what you need it to do and it's not accessible. We still need to make sure there's some kind of alternative, especially if it's a requirement for that individual's job. So that is where you sometimes have to work with HR, your accommodations process, identify things that you can do. Maybe it's one that it's an accessible document instead of that of the, the application that you're you're working with or using. There's a lot of different things, but this is where we have to get really creative, but it's important to ask that question, especially if we do find a product that's not accessible, that can't be made accessible soon, but you still need it from a business case. So going through and just validating a lot of this information, um, you know, they, the vendors themselves should provide information around accessibility. Um, they should also be able to commit to addressing the accessibility issues. Going back to that SLA that I had mentioned is very important. Um, you know, when we're talking about accessibility, you know, it is important to understand that it's never going to be 100% we are constantly evolving. Technology is constantly changing. You know, looking at AI and now looking at, you know, AR and things like that, a virtual, rea virtual reality, how do we make these things accessible? So we sometimes have to be able to give grace and work with these groups to be able to provide input as long as they're willing to make changes. Um, so when we are talking about all of this and having those overall assurances, um, just try to work with the product that's going to meet accessibility at the fullest it, that it can. Um, also look at making a commitment with that vendor to ensure that they can improve that accessibility and do it within a specific time frame. If you have a one-year contract and they tell you it's gonna take three years to make it accessible, okay, I see a problem there because it's not gonna help me. Um, so what can they do to make the critical or the high issues fixed within a few matter of months because I only have a year contract. Um, you know, when we're looking at that, applying that of the VPAT into it, also looking at your satisfactory progress within that of, is that part of the contractual agreement? If, you know, both parties are not fully satisfied, then that might be a way out of that contract. So is accessibility part of it? Um, you know, just going through and looking at and identifying your language, I recommend you work with your legal team, look, working with your procurement, identify what your current procurement process is. When we're talking about accessibility, we are not creating anything new. We're simply adding it into what's already there. So that's really the most important factor is as we kind of talk about all of these things, as we've mentioned some new acronyms and, and terms, we're not doing anything quote unquote new. We're just wanting to improve the current process that is in place and incorporate accessibility from there. So I have covered a very large amount of information in a very short amount of time, but I find that this is really where it's a better time to have conversation um, around that of procurement because it looks different for everyone. So Juan, Anna, I'll hand it back off to you all. Uh, Anna, um, sorry, Kara, thank you so much. Um, so for sure, I think, um, the participants on the sorry the attendees if they have any questions that that would be great, and um I do have a question as you are 
Bitcoin through procurement. We pull out the um, uh, the the VPAT, but um, when they submit the VPAT, is there something else that they that they should let you know, or, or something in addition to just the VPAT and the different chapters that you're going to be looking for, or even when trying to do negotiations, what else uh, could potentially be looked for? Uh, just to try to ensure that accessibility is uh, at the for forefront for them. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I will look at the company website and just look for the accessibility of that as a good starting point, because if they can't make the website accessible, then it kind of gives you a, a view of just the level of prioritization um, mm -hmm. and how easy they implement it into their their company stance, because a website is what gets them the business that you're asking them for a VPAT. So if they're not putting it in the very front, exposing that everywhere, then that kind of gives you an idea of where the VPAT instance might be. Oh, interesting. That's, that's actually a very good point. So obviously organizations should not, not, should, only, should not only have an accessible product, but they have to ensure that the websites are accessible as well. And, and I imagine documentation as well, like PDFs or Word documents, if they have it on their websites. So yes, absolutely. Sure. And one of the things I've seen a lot of times is we're starting to get more into HTML mm -hmm. for product documentation on how to use the product, but there's still a lot of PDFs and things. So are those PDFs accessible? Maybe there's a how-to video. Is those videos providing captioning? Have they thought about audio description? Um, it's just very holistic when we thought when we think about accessibility. So the product itself, a lot of times they look at it from a very one-sided, um, where it's a multi, you know, faceted instance to where if it's not looking at it holistically, then they may not fully understand accessibility as a company. They're just trying to meet a compliance. That's great. That's a great point. Thank you. Anna, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions listed in the chat or the Q&A window. I wonder if we can invite the participants to post any questions they might have at this mm -hmm. time, uh, or if any of our other panelists or hosts have questions, please do ask. Making it easy on me. Yeah. You can hear you. <laughs> well, I've got one actually. So you mentioned sort of at the beginning of your presentation, Kara, and thank you again for that brilliant um, uh, deep dive into how this all might work together. I was wondering how you introduce this conversation into the enterprise architecture conversation. So that seems like the sort of 30,000 footer that then leads us to the detail of the implementation itself for accessibility. How do you oh, I, this specifically? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so one of the things I had done at um, an institution I had worked with was we had looked at the procurement process and went to the procurement officials to say, what are your gaps? What are your issues that you face? Because, you know, when we ask that question, we're not asking it about accessibility. We're asking about their process and their gap overall. So that's where they may be able to say, well, you know, company, department A purchased this $50,000 software only to learn that it doesn't work with our servers. Or, you know, company, you know, department Z purchased this only to find out that it doesn't meet our security, you know, our SSO or whatever. So now we have to sign in a different way. So if you go to your procurement officials and truly ask them like, what are the hiccups? What are the, the delays? What are the gaps that you find that cause problems with procuring anything from their standpoint and see what they have? Then that really allows you to be able to see what does an architecture group look like to be able to solve that problem. And then you're incorporating accessibility into it when accessibility wasn't even on their radar to begin with. I like that answer. I think it's uh, fascinating how you can actually go and try to talk to the different teams within the organization to understand what it is that they need uh, in order for you to further enhance the accessibility. Um, I actually do have another question. So right now that you talk about working with other teams, um, when it comes to accessibility, how can you actually sell the benefits so they are actively or proactively 
um, uh, looking for accessibility as opposed to be an afterthought or maybe coming to your desk and hey, we need to see whether this is accessible, but by the way, we have a really uh, bad program or the software or the service. Oh, that's, that is, that is a loaded question. <laughs> um, so let's break this down. Um, the benefits, I mean, first and foremost, accessibility is not just for disabilities. It, it benefits everyone, right? Um, it doesn't matter if we look at our mobile design guidelines and accessibility guidelines, which overlap a lot. And if you say, hey, do you want your customers to be able to access everything on a mobile phone? Well, yeah. Um, then let's let's help that by making accessibility um, built into that. I mean, that's, you know, finding your back door. Um, is always important because sometimes accessibility isn't always seen as the priority. Um, but when you're talking with different groups, especially sometimes higher management, find that back door of what they are interested in. If it is money, um, you know, hey, if we incorporate accessibility earlier into the process rather than testing after the fact, here, you know, because I know that there's been research and things said that it's cost 10 times more to test and remediate for accessibility after it's in production versus that of incorporating it into the very early process. All right, there's your sales pitch. You've done it backdoor because they're they're interested in the money um, versus that of maybe it is their marketing and they want it to be more mobile friendly. Then that's where your mobile guidelines and your accessibility guidelines um, kind of overlap a little bit. So find your backdoor of those of what they are interested in and find a way to incorporate accessibility there. Excellent. Kara, thank you so much for being part of our event. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, make the presentation and speaking to our audience. It, it was great having you here. Thank you, Juan. Always a pleasure.